Welcome to this afternoon's presentation, which is Leading Effective Online Discussions. Now, just before we get into everything, I just want to start with the land acknowledgement. So we would like to begin by respectfully acknowledging that the land on which the University of Windsor is located is the traditional territory of the Three Fires Confederacy, which includes the Ojibwe, the Potawatomi, and the Odawa. And then given the virtual nature of this workshop, we understand that not everybody may be in the Windsor-Essex area. And so we'd like to extend this acknowledgement to the whole of Turtle Island. So a little bit about us, just to introduce ourselves. So my name is Danielle Salters, and I'm a first year doctoral student in the Faculty of Human Kinetics or the Department of Kinesiology, specializing in motor learning and control. So I have been a GA for two years now, over four semesters, mostly in the kinesiology department. And I really enjoy supporting students and giving, helping the instructor in these various roles, especially through teaching and interacting with the students. And I'll turn it over to Miriam so she can introduce herself. Thank you, Danielle. My name is Miriam. I'm a PhD candidate in environmental science at GLEAR, which is the Great Lakes Institute for Environmental Research. Um, I focus a lot on uh, tracking aquatic fossils and, and ancient um, archives, uh, ancient lake archives. Uh, so I, I track a lot of biological and ecological changes through thousands and thousands of years. I worked as a first, first I worked as a TA in undergrad in 2015, and that was a very eye opening experience. And then after I started grad school, which was in 2017, uh, I've been a GA since. So uh, I've learned a lot through my experience, and hopefully, the tips that we have today will help you have a successful semester. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Miriam. So first off, I'd like to start off with a question for everybody. So how many of you are first time or are first time GAs? And we'll put up a poll so you can answer. Okay, so it seems like we have a lot of first time GAs here today, which is awesome. So hopefully we can give you some valuable information and hopefully you'll be able to use this in your GA or TA ships. So just moving forward, just the learning outcomes for today's presentation. So first off, we hope to facilitate some understanding of the different types of discussion structures that they are, that there are in the online environment. Also, we hope to help you develop the skills necessary to create meaningful questions and advance the discourse in your discussion sessions. Also help give you the tools in order to develop a positive learning environment for these online discussions, especially the synchronous ones, which we'll talk more about in a couple of minutes. And then communicate the need and the characteristics of effective feedback during online discussion posts, either asynchronous or synchronously. And then recognize that there can be conflict and common fears in online discussions and try to find some ways to overcome those. So moving into it a little bit, let's just use the text feature that's on whiteboard that should be in the top right corner to answer this question. When you hear discussion, what, how would you describe a discussion? Yep, a conversation, great. You can either put this in the chat or you can use the text feature that's in the top right corner of the screen to just write it right on the slide. An exchange of ideas, that's great. An exchange of, an, of opinions, Natalie wrote in the chat. Multiple people engaging in a conversation, yep. So I'm just gonna drag that over here to match up. Sharing knowledge, absolutely. deeper understanding of the topic, meaningful discourse on a particular subject, possibly a debate sometimes, depending on the content, uh, processing ideas and thoughts, informing and learning. Yeah, these are all great processing ideas. Yeah, these are all great 
contributions. Focus questions about readings. Yep, sometimes that's usually discussions are related to the content. So these ones about processing ideas, learning, focus questions, these are all really great. Sharing perspectives, yep. Confronting perspectives to find a kind of consensus, yep, absolutely. Communication, absolutely, Laura, communication is key. A way to make sure students understand, yeah, absolutely. A way for people to voice themselves, yep. New ideas, absolutely. Okay. Now, moving on a little bit, so we'll stop with the text. We're going to actually talk about what is a discussion now. So what a discussion is, is it involves active learning. And this is where the students are actually involved in formulating ideas and communicating. When we think of passive learning, this is when you're maybe sitting in the lecture, kind of like we're doing right now. And especially for this slide, there's not much that the student is doing. But with active learning, the student is actively doing something to contribute. So whether that's coming, going, doing a reading and then coming and sharing their own perspectives or doing an activity based on that reading, those are active learning uh, methods. And then discussions do tend to be more learning centered. So you're reaching a higher level of thinking when you're using a discussion. It's not just about the students gaining the knowledge, they're using that knowledge in some way. They're using that information to help them progress their understanding. And the great thing about the discussions is that they're in the classroom and they're really working to develop those critical thinking skills, which is where discussions really play a role in communicating application of the skills or the concepts that are learned in lecture or readings analyzing those concepts, how might they contribute to the wider community outside of higher education? Creativity, so that brings it back to application. Can they apply these concepts or these theories or ideas in different contexts? And then synthesis, which is bringing these concepts together and seeing a wider picture. So the big question a lot of times that happens is how do we prepare for a lecture, or for a discussion, sorry. So the big aspect of it, the central theme here is to know those learning outcomes. And generally as a GA, you may or may not have any impact on what the learning's outcome might be. These might be prescribed by the professor or the instructor that you're working for. So based on the learning outcomes that either the instructor provides or that you develop, these have to be central to your planning of the discussion. And then to the left here, we see content. Now this is what the instructor of the course is going to prescribe. They're going to set the content that needs to be covered, and they're going to go through this by going through the lectures and the readings. And then your job is to, on that right side there, the application of those concepts, and that's finding ways to apply that content. So like we said on the previous slide, the application, synthesis, creativity, those are all things that discussion. So really just knowing what the learning outcomes are and how to get to the discussion is going to be crucial to your role. Going through, like we said, knowing those learning outcomes is really important. So for example, for this workshop, as I went through before, the second learning outcome that we had or the learning goal that we had was to create meaningful questions and advance discourse. So as a GA, how you would prepare that is to provide students with the background knowledge. So that would be through the lectures and the readings. And then your job is to plan the activities. So for example, us as the instructors, we prepared the background information, the discussion preparation tips and strategies, which will be coming very shortly. And then we have activities that are going to really help ground those concepts and help you develop a deeper understanding on how to use those and what to do for the discussion techniques. 
your role as a GA or TA is really important. So your job is to prepare the students for the, for the discussion. So really ensure that at the beginning of the discussion, you want to make sure that they've got the background information necessary. So are you planning a discussion for material that the instructor has covered in the class? If you are planning for a discussion and the instructor hasn't covered that material in class yet, you're not going to have a very efficient discussion. It's not going to have a lot of participation and you're not going to get a lot of engagement. So you need to make sure that each week you have a discussion or each discussion period that you have, they have that background knowledge necessary. Now, like I said before, it's not up to you to provide that background knowledge, but it is up to you to make sure that you are providing discussion sessions that are on track with what is being taught in class. And that goes along with keeping discussions on track and creating an inclusive, sorry, that should say an, creating an inclusive environment where the students are encouraged to participate. So this is coming from creating a positive learning environment. You want to make sure that everybody is going to have their perspectives heard and everybody is going to feel comfortable participating in this discussion. And then it all ties back again to the need to reach those learning goals. There should be a purpose to the discussion and that's something where you need to plan around the learning goals to guide what your discussion is going to target and once you have those learning goals, the activities come pretty easily. So you can plan activities that are going to directly influence the goals that you have for that, less, that session. Now, as a facilitator, there are, for discussions, there are five main roles for the facilitator. The first role is, has to do with regulating. And this has to share, has to do with sharing with the students how you see yourself in the discussion. Are you communicating with the students what your specific role as the facilitator is? Are you just there to provide the questions and let them go back and forth with each other? Are you there to make sure they've done the readings? These are the things that you need to question when you're thinking about what your role as a facilitator might be. In an online discussion, especially when there's a mix of posts or verbal discussions, it's, um, there's a need to remind your students that you will be facilitating the discussions. So that doesn't necessarily mean that you're there to reply to every single post that is made. You're there to make general conclusions and assessments based on their weekly contributions, if there is a weekly discussion, but based on their contributions to the discussion. You're not necessarily there to say, oh, so-and-so said this, and so-and-so said this. Students can reply to each other, but your job is to make sure everything's running smoothly from a broader sense. And then communicate with the students as well about your schedule online and offline, because you as a GA or TA, you don't have to be available 24-7 to them. So this is why you have office hours or set discussion periods if it's synchronous. The, discuss the office hours are there for students to come to you and ask questions outside of discussions. And that's when they can come to you if it's an asynchronous post. And then also every session or at the beginning of the uh, period, you should communicate the course expectations for the students. So the professor will generally do this, but if it's a synchronous discussion where you're all together at a set time, there's a need to communicate to the students what type of communication you're expecting, how often they should be talking, the quality expectations, and for this, all of these should also be in line with the expectations that were set from the instructor. So you don't want your expectations to be different from those of the course. They need to be in line with each other. Now, the second of the five 
kind of roles is to is inviting you need to be inviting and by this i mean it's motivating and encouraging the students by posting questions or prompting them or trying to advance the discussions if you think see things are stagnant or if you see things there's a lull in conversation is there a way that you can chime in to try to get some new ideas flowing calling on good connections that are made by students and creating what are called quote unquote weaving posts to that link ideas together so sometimes students may not see the connections between their ideas so this is where you might come in to say oh but how does so and so's idea compared to this idea and that can really help create a more inviting discussion and help to advance the discussion in ways that may not be uh, nat quote unquote natural for the students. The third role is summarizing and this is simply just highlighting the main points and conclusion and conclusions from the discussions and the student posts. Third we have assessing. So generally the GA or TA will be, who is in charge of facilitating the discussion will be responsible for providing feedback um, for those posts or the discussion contributions. And generally that's pretty early in the course. You want to set your, the type of feedback that you're doing, you want the students to know that as early as possible so that there's no surprises down the road and they can improve their discussion skills as the course goes along. Um, so when there is a large class, so if you have a large lecture hall class of like, I would say over a hundred students, it can be challenging to provide individualized feedback for every discussion for every student. So in these situations, I think that providing general observation or feedback to either the whole class or to groups can have a big impact on helping to advance the students' discussion skills throughout the course. And then finally, there is the role of support. So be, a, be available for the students during the set office hour times that you have or during the discussion times even, especially if the discussion time is synchronous which is where it's running at a set time and everybody has to be online for that. That's really important that you're available for those. And then also just finally giving the students a leading role. So it really has a big impact on the contribution and the engagement in the discussion if you're letting the students take leading roles in the discussion so that they are taking ownership of their own learning and not relying on you very heavily for their learning in these sessions. And then just some strategies for running the discussions. First off, just be very clear and concise. So you don't want tons of extra language or beating around the bush especially if you have tons of students that you're trying to communicate with, be very clear and just get right to the point. As I've mentioned repeatedly, aligning the discussions with your learning goals and learning outcomes, especially if those are set by the instructor or the professor, because there is a reason that they've set those outcomes and you're trying to facilitate activities that help the students gain that knowledge and understanding. Thirdly, promote positive group dynamics. And then finally, summarize the discussion points as I mentioned on the previous slide. Now, as I've mentioned, there are two main types of discussion. The first type of discussion is synchronous. And this is where participation occurs at the same time in a structured meeting format. So for example, what we're doing right now is a synchronous meeting. Asynchronous, on the other hand, is when the participants can exchange ideas at different times or during a set time period. So what this could be is you have to post on the Blackboard discussion board between Tuesday and Thursday. So that would be a set time, but the students are able to do that on their own, on their own schedule. 
So does anybody see any benefits or challenges that are related to asynchronous or synchronous discussions? So I'm seeing a lot of for asynchronous, um, you can attend and you have time to think on your own time, time to generate ideas, the time that you have available. Synchronous can be more engaging as you're talking with others. Yep, Laura, synchronous challenges can be interrupted conversation, hard to take terms. Yeah, absolutely, you're all completely right. So for synchronous discussion, the main benefit, synchronous help wrap up everything in session, which could otherwise last weeks, yeah. So the benefits that I have for synchronous discussion are that it facilitates a more natural back and forth. You're having a more natural conversation with the other students and instructors in the class, whereas the challenges are your ideas may not be fully developed. It can, yeah, it can lead to more off topics, yep, and it can just be sometimes just thinking off the top of your head instead of having deeper thoughts about the content. And for the GA, it can be really challenging for us as GA or TAs to moderate those conversations because you never know what someone's going to say. And if the conversation goes off the rails and becomes off topic, we as GAs or TAs then have to find ways to bring it back to the group, which can be challenging. And then the benefits of asynchronous discussion, on the other hand, the students can participate, like we said, based on their own schedule. They have time to really think about and develop those deeper thoughts before they post them on the discussion board. And then it allows us as instructors or GA or TAs who are doing the assessments to get a feeling for how well the students actually grasp the content. And then the challenges for this can be some students may not post, so they may forget or they just may not want to post. So there can be lower engagement and then the quality of posts is going to vary greatly. But in general, the benefits of discussion, oops, sorry, get to the slide. In general, the benefits of discussion are going to outweigh the challenges. So in general, the work quality is going to improve because students have time to reflect on their contributions. They may have more time to prepare and look up the information, do the required readings, which they may not have if it is a synchronous in-person discussion. Uh, netiquette is something important that we all have in today's world. We all have to have netiquette, which is the way to carry yourself online, how to post and communicate with other professionals in an online environment. Especially with asynchronous, it can improve your writing skills. Everybody has equal opportunities to participate because like we said on the previous slide, some people may not feel comfortable talking in a synchronous format. So this gives people the opportunities to contribute. And then finally, it, whether it's synchronous or asynchronous, it can expand on the classroom learning. So it can provide more context for the information that's provided in the class. In the class, generally, it can end up being a lot of surface material. So this way, you have more time for activities that actually help the students grasp, grasp the content a little bit deeper. And the main job for discussions, the main challenge is creating meaningful questions. So the questions, there's five characteristics of meaningful questions. The first is that it's related to the course material. So like we said with our learning outcomes and learning goals, if those are provided for you, you'll be able to come up with questions that directly relate to the learning outcomes. Questions that are meaningful also foster higher level thinking. So not just those yes or no answers, 
you need questions that make people synthesize, apply, have creativity, those types of skills that we talked about previously. Meaningful questions should also be open-ended. Yes or no questions or fact or knowledge-based questions don't foster that deeper thinking skills or higher level thinking. Meaningful questions also ask for clarity. So why, how, what makes you think this? These types of questions. And then as a facilitator, it's really important, especially if the discussion is synchronous, to have active think, active listening skills so that you're listening to what the students are saying and can you come, are you coming up with questions that facilitate d even deeper thinking than what the students are contributing? And these are just types of questions that could be used. So knowledge questions are questions that test for content knowledge or subject matter. So not necessarily that higher level thinking. Comprehension questions are a little bit deeper, and these are ones that ask students to explain, interpret, give examples, or communicate the concept in their own words, which kind of assesses for the surface level understanding of the concept. Application skills, like we said, this is getting a little bit deeper now, requires us to think about application of the knowledge. So, how can we use this concept in our everyday lives? For example, analysis, even deeper still. So application of the principles in new settings. So if my field is in motor development, can I take that and apply that to a physical education class? Synthesis is even deeper still, and this is combining ideas, so bringing ideas from different disciplines or different theories and seeing how they link to each other. And then finally, the highest level of thinking that we have is evaluation, and this is making a judgment. So how would you assess this? What do you think is the most important and why? And what do you think about this? Why do you think that? those types of questions. So, with these types of discussion questions in mind, we have an activity for you. So, we're going to put you into one of six breakout rooms. And in each breakout room, I'm going to come and I'm going to give you a very specific question. So, in your groups, I want you, we want you to discuss whether you think this is a good or a poor question, and why. Okay, so when we put you in your breakout groups, read the question very carefully, take a minute to think about your own ideas, and then discuss it together. You can either do it in the chat or you can turn on your microphones and chat with each other and discuss whether you think that question is good or poor and why. And then after about five or six minutes, we're going to bring you back to the main group and I want one person from each group to kind of talk to us about your question. And I will show the question to the whole group. So you don't have to read your question, but I just want you to think, is it good or bad or why? And then tell that to the whole group so we can discuss, okay? So we're going to send you into your breakout groups now. Okay. So we should all be back in the main room now. So if everybody wouldn't mind just muting their mics again. I'm sorry if I interrupted any of your conversations, but time was up in our breakout groups. So let's just have a quick discussion based on the questions. So group one, if your spokesperson can turn on their mic and tell us what you found based on your question. So uh, we forgot to nominate a spokesperson, but I guess I'll just go over quickly what we all thought of the question. So it's not a terrible question. It's reasonably op op open-ended, um, but we all generally agreed that uh, you can get caught up in the weeds of how broad the question is. So your, your job could just be to guide the students out, out, out of the weeds when that does happen, but you could also perhaps design the question to focus in on 
specific areas or give them prompts that would allow them to specifically talk about different aspects of the materials that that were in the course but on the whole we mostly agreed that it was too broad a question and the discussions would be so broad and and long based on how long your answer would have to be that it would be difficult to have a good discussion around it right so one positive about this question that i could say is that it does have the students using critical reasoning skills to relate their thoughts back to the course materials. But other than that, I, I, you're 100% correct. And so let's go to number two. Does group two have a spokesperson? Hi, Danielle. We did not actually nominate a spokesperson, but we did have discussion over chat regarding this question. So okay. some key points that I took down were that uh, one thing that we noticed was that the question was quite was worded casually. Um, it would depend more on contextual settings. Uh, so was there an example before? Was it during a, a lecture that maybe an example was given prior to this question being posed? In that case, it may be appropriate in some settings, but overall, we discussed how it was vague, that we didn't really have a de definition or perspective of democracy in, uh, in question two. And it was overall did not have a lot of direction. It was just very open ended in a way that we may have trouble directing conversation in the direct in the way we need to, depending on the course and how exactly our learning outcomes were. Yeah, absolutely. And group number three. So that looks like it's in the chat. So I'll just read it out loud. So as the question is right now, it's not a great discussion question. Circle level, it is yes or no, but it's lacking in context and there are more inventors of the telephone with Bell being the most famous. It would be better to leave this open-ended with who deserves the credit out of the four creators or how has the telephone impacted our world. The quality of the question is dependent upon the class in which it is presented. It could be a yes or no question if, in a, if it's an electrical class or a discussion if a history class because you can argue why or why not. It needs more context, and the addition of a how or why would be needed to promote higher level thinking. Absolutely. And group level four, group number four, sorry, do we have a spokesperson? Uh, yeah, so we figured that it was, um, the question itself was actually really good. Um, we were all saying, like, if we saw it on an exam or anything like that, we would not be too surprised. It calls on the readings or uh, possibly what the readings would have been uh, using different authors as well as quotes uh, with like nasty, brutish, and short. So it directs the students' uh, attention or how they should um, approach the question and gives them footholds essentially to further their own argument in believing that whether humans are inherently good or not. And then it also follows up with having them uh, explain why. Yep, absolutely. Great insight into that question. And then group number five. Yeah, hi. We, we have discussed that uh, due to the material, uh, due to the background, it has says the 5,000 species were moved to endangered animals. That means uh, if, if this is a work, that means it have to be in the rule. And uh, the question is better to be getting in touch with the background. So this question we think is really good because it's always um, relate to the course material and it's valuable because the one uh, due to the background that um, the moving to the and to the uh, endangered animal to the uh, list that means it has uh, it need to be taken by a lot of different departments and which parts are doing what job is really meaningful so we think this question is quite good and it's, uh, it's a meaningful question yep also great insight that's exactly what i had as well and then for the last group, group six, what did we think? All right, so just right off the bat, we found a grammatical issue with uh, the sentence in hockey player uh, proposed for the assumption. Yeah. That. So that was one thing, obviously. And uh, the other one is the assumption that everybody knows who Wayne Gretzky is. That's the way this question was actually structured. And taken out of context, it would be very difficult to actually answer that question because how would you know um, what kind of rewards he would have won or if he was actually a coach 
and whatnot, the context is very vague in this sense because some people might not know who Wayne Gretzky is. Uh, that being said, <clears throat> the question seemed very specific as well uh, on a yes or no basis. And the structure of it was uh, two knowledge-based questions, which is something you would need to know beforehand in order to answer. And then there was one evaluation. So like uh, an opinionative question on like what kind of coach he was uh, based off of the assumptions of the research and facts that you found beforehand. So uh, it's a pretty good question given that you know what's going on. Otherwise, you're kind of at loss of how to actually answer it if you're coming from say like right now, uh, how could I answer that? It'd be a little bit more difficult. Right. So just bringing this activity to a close, I just want to say that you all did a great job with analyzing these questions. I had three poor questions and three good questions. So I'm glad that you guys kind of saw the which ones were poor and which ones were good. So now I will turn it over to Miriam for the rest of the presentation. Thank you, Daniel. So now that we've uh, talked a bit about, you know, setting up our discuss discussion questions, we're going to move on to, um, you know, carrying them out in the classroom. And before we actually carry them out in the classroom, we need to set up a good classroom environment. Setting up a positive classroom environment is important to all of us, but it's not really something that we think about so much. Um, when we're preparing our lessons. And, and this is something that's particularly important for uh, discussion-based classes or labs. I mean, if you have lectures, especially if they're online, you don't really have as much interaction between students. Um, but when there are discussions, you do. And so that the importance of getting students comfortable with the class and, and more familiar with each other is, is a lot more, right? And as we see here, positive and having a positive environment is one that's conducive to learning, one in which students feel comfortable with one another and the assistant. So the teaching assistant or the uh, graduate assistant. And this is something that you actually have to work to to prepare. You have to pl on the screen, we have like a few characteristics of that positive learning environment. So you want an environment where people are actively engaging. People are, um, you know, it encourages respect. Uh, we have an enthusiastic attitude in there. You're encouraging that, um, you know, you're, you're making people excited to contribute. Right, open up to ideas and challenges. You're not just focused on a certain point that you want to get across. You want to encourage people to have their different opinions, even if they don't necessarily align with yours. Uh, diversity and inclusivity are acknowledged. Um, and so I'll talk a bit, a bit, a bit about uh, setting up that that positive environment. We want to first uh, plan and prepare. You want to when you set up a classroom environment. Um, you want to introduce that concept within the first uh, the first time you meet with the students. So one way you can do this is break the ice a bit between students, have them get familiar with each other. And this is super simple. You can simply just, you know, ask them to introduce themselves. You can ask them. It depends on like how many students you have in a section. Um, it, so, but uh, you can do things like, you know, you can do the basic things like ask them to say their name, and their program. Uh, you can go a bit further, ask them to share like one of their favorite memories. That all depends on how much time you have. But you, you want them to at least introduce themselves, right? And then uh, if you want to go further, you can even have icebreakers. And that doesn't just mean having icebreakers on the first day, but you can have them throughout the semester. For example, um, this is like a very common practice with with a lot of uh, instructors when you know when it's Monday and it's a, a new week in the class. You can ask people how how um, you know how their weekend went or you can ask them how their week went. Little things like that. They don't have to be deep questions. They, they should be really simple and really easy for people to respond to. Um, but little things like that can really get people to connect with each other. And once you have um, that sort of connection, it's a lot easier to create an inclusive classroom environment. So we're going to be distributing a handout later. Uh, you'll be getting it in your email. And this handout will give you more detailed 
uh, more detailed steps on how you can create that, that classroom environment, um, mainly because for the sake of time in this workshop in particular, we want you to get familiar, familiar with a lot of the activities and uh, ways you can have discussions, you know, from the whiteboard to the polls to the, to the, uh, well, the polls was more of an icebreaker, but to uh, the breakout rooms, and we have another activity with for you today. But um, so we have that summarized for you in the handout that we'll pass out later on. But essentially, what you're going to do is you want to make sure that you are not uh, that you don't expect that all students are going to have the same expectations as you. Don't expect that all students know what it means to have a positive classroom environment. Remember that everyone comes from a different background. Uh, everyone has different experiences in life. So don't expect that you know throughout the semester people are going to know how to encourage other students or know how to give other students you know their space. Um, you need to from the beginning outline as a group what the rules are that you're going to set for all discussions in the class and once you set those rules i mean it can be a bit d difficult depending on the way that you are setting up your classroom so if you have live uh, discussion you can all you know go over those ground rules as a group right you can have you can ask them what they expect from each other and they can respond in the chat and um and you know you could probably put it up on you can write it on the whiteboard as you go along but uh, in an asynchronous group you might have to have a discussion board or um you might have to have people submit responses and then go over them later so there might be different ways about how you do this but it is essential that you get this done because when you get this done, you are showing that there's a standard and there's a certain norm that has to be kept within the classroom. And once you have that done, you have to make sure that you uh, that you uh, present it in some way. So if you're having live discussion classes, you can have it uh, on on the whiteboard or in the PowerPoint that you're showing in the corner whenever you have when you're starting up a lecture or on the main page of the Blackboard site. Um, if you're having discussion boards, so if it's more asynchronous, you can have it top at the top in the description. These are also really good to come back to from time to time if you feel like discussions are getting a bit rowdy or you know it's not as open or as friendly as you would like it to be, right? And um, it's also important that as you set up your classroom environment, uh, you make sure that you within yourself are not uh, discouraging discussion. And what I mean by that is make sure that you're that you stay pretty neutral when people are giving their opinions, even if they're opinions that resonate more with you or opinions that you believe are more correct. Make sure you are not. Um, you know, facilitating in a way where you are just, you know, sticking to a certain opinion, encouraging a certain opinion, and not really encouraging people to, you know, think outside the box, have different points that might not, you know, they might not resonate with you as much, but you need to stay neutral and allow people to be as, to allow people to be as open as possible uh, within these sessions, because, you know, when you're sticking to a certain, like, topic or a certain idea that you like, students are eventually just going to say, they're going, to, they're, they're pretty smart, right? And they, they all want to succeed in the course. So instead of them thinking deeper and thinking about you know, different perspectives and, uh, and whatnot, what they're going to start doing is they're just going to start saying things that you like to hear. They're not really going to be learning as much as they could be. Um, they're just going to be trying to please you when really you sh your role is not to get people to please you. Your, your role is to encourage learning and, and get them to meet the learning goals that uh, Danielle taught you how to how to make. And so you'll get more information on that in the uh, in the handout uh, that we're going to send to you later on. Fostering positive group dynamics adds stability in the groups. Uh, you know, you're not swaying in one direction or another. You, there's less of a chance that that discussions are going to be polarized. And what I mean is that uh, that they're going to be um, that like one person is going to dominate the discussion. Um, if you're fostering a positive group environment, uh, um, environment you know, you're going to get a more quiet students uh, contributing because they're going to feel more comfortable. 
And uh, people will be, with people being more comfortable with each other, that you'll find them encouraging each other in the classroom. And that also creates it, uh, a more stable environment. It helps advanced discussions. So, um, you know, by being neutral and encouraging people to share their ideas, um, no matter how simple or how complex they are, you're really helping people, um, giving them that opportunity to say what's on their mind in a respectful way, as uh, of course, and that allows you to help them carry on that discussion further and think even deeper. Uh, it Im helps improve communication skills. So a lot of times in your university, I, I don't know about you, but like with me, um, I studied I studied French and and uh, biology in undergrad, and I didn't really have so many courses where we didn't do multiple choice tests or essays. You know, like mo that's pretty much what we did most of the time. Uh, I think I only had a few courses where I actually had the chance to have discussions. And I think in those courses especially, that's what really helped me build my communication skills. Uh, that's what really helped me be able to take on what someone else, is, what someone else says, you know, in an academic setting and be able to, you know, exchange ideas with them and whatnot. And so you're, uh, you're giving these students an opportunity to advance their communication skills and you're helping them with their teamwork skills. So being in a discussion, exchanging ideas, that's something that uh, allows, that that needs people to interact with each other, right? And and so uh, when, I, I'm thinking back to the classes where I, uh, I had discussions, um, with time as you have a positive group and a positive, you know, environment and, um, you, you might have, like, for example, some quieter students. When you have in a positive environment, you'll see that students who are a bit more talkative will be encouraging those quieter students. You know, you have you have people working together as a team. It doesn't happen overnight, but as you maintain this positive classroom, you'll see a lot of great things happen from it. And, you know, with trying to maintain the classroom, no matter what you do, there are at times uh, instances where you might run into conflict. So what is conflict? And here um, in some of the older, earlier literature we see in the field, we see conflict defined as a disagreement or opposition due to differences or perceived differences in interests, ideas, goals, or values. So essentially, in a conflict, uh, the main point here is that we have some sort of difference. And when we're not able to tolerate our differences, we end up in a conflict, right? If we don't manage it with it the right way. Um, just wanted to let you know before we move in more into the idea of conflicts is that conflicts are not always bad. Um, what's sometimes, it depends on the conflict, but sometimes what's more important than the conflict itself is how you manage it. and Learning how to manage conflicts the right way, especially in the in the classroom, can actually become a teaching moment for those in the classroom. You might give it the students um, a better experience that they can uh, mirror later on whenever they run into conflicts uh, in in the future in academic settings. Because you know you're always going to get conflicts; it's inevitable. But the way that you deal with it is what's going to make the difference. And so this goes over how, you know, how conflicts happen. There, it's pretty much a cycle between, um, between you know, the event, uh, like the certain situation in itself that is the conflict, the way that it is perceived. So it's per if it's perceived as something that's very negative, um, that's a conflict. And then we have some sort of defensive anger and then attack. So thinking about uh, what a conflict is, the pattern, of, the key components of a uh, of a conflict, is important for you as an instructor because it helps you be able to break it up the con the conflict. And what you want to do is, you want to work backwards to be able to identify, okay, what was that event? What was the cause of that conflict? And what are we going to do about it? And here on this slide, we have conflict resolution strategies. So in the beginning, 
When a conflict happens in the in the classroom, we want to acknowledge it. We want to, we, you know, we, you shouldn't sugarcoat it and act like everything is fine and move on. Um, that's not really healthy. Um, you're letting the class know that um, they could get away with it if they do something that's negative, right? And um, you're also hurting the feelings of those who are affected by the conflict. It, it, it's a way of letting them know that, you know, oh, like, this is not such a big deal. You know, just get over it and we'll move on. You actually want to take pause. Uh, it might distract you for your, from your lesson for a bit, but there's a bigger lesson in, behind actually resolving the conflict. So you want to stop, you want to acknowledge it, and make sure that you are remaining calm. You know, it's very easy to get stressed out uh, and get stuck in the moment and panic or get super emotional. But you need to take a step back and remain calm because um, heightened emotions can sometimes lead to unreasonable actions. So if you're really emotional, you might be siding with one person too much. You know, you might not be objective. And when you're super emotional, what can happen sometimes is in the moment you actually might be saying things or doing something or dealing with the the uh, conflict in a way that you're going to regret later on. You might think later on, oh, you know what? I was a bit too emotional. Um, I sided with this person too much, but now I understand that person's you know, perspective and maybe I wronged them in this way. You want to avoid all that. You want to calm yourself down for a bit. You know, if you need to, take some time to, you know, breathe in, breathe out slowly, and then move on by listening to the people involved and Truly try to understand the problem. You want to be as objective as possible here. And once you feel like you've understood, tell them what you've understood from the problem to just make sure that everything is clear and you guys are all on the same page. If you feel like you had some sort of, um, you know, you, you may have caused a bit of the problem, you may have done something that led to the problem, don't be afraid to apologize. It doesn't make you weak. It doesn't make, mean that you are a terrible instructor. Uh, it means that you take responsibility for your actions and that you're mature and that uh, you're working to better yourself. So if anything, it makes you a better instructor. But it, don't uh, be apologizing for things that you haven't done. So just don't say sorry just for the sake of it. Only apologize if you feel like you've done something that needs an apology. apology. Afterwards, you can sit down and generate possible solutions with the, for the students. Um, and then if you feel like this is a difficult situation, remember that you're not in the classroom or you're not in the course alone, right? You are a graduate assistant or a teaching assistant. You're responsible for select students, whether it's during the for a lab or for you know for the course. And ultimately, you ultimately you have the course instructor there who you can refer to, and who can help. Um, like it's it's their job to help you whenever you need the help. So don't be afraid to reach out to them. I wanted to point out that some conflicts can actually be avoided by setting ground rules at the beginning of the semester. Remember what we said about setting the classroom environment? Don't assume that everyone understands or everyone has the same expectations going in. So when you set, take the time to set those ground rules, I know sometimes it feels like you're under pressure for time, but if you take a bit of time to set those ground rules and let them know what you expect and have them you know, fully understand that, it can actually help avoid a lot of problems later on. In the handout, we also have some tips on what you can do if you feel like a student is dominating the discussion. So sometimes you'll get some of those students who are really excited to contribute, but sometimes what happens is it's almost like they're taking on the whole discussion, right? And it, sometimes it feels like, you know, some people are not as inclined to participate because they already see someone participating or or maybe they feel intimidating so what to do when you're in that situation and uh, on the other hand we have we have situations where you have students who are not participating whether they're shy or they just don't feel you know so into it as much or so connected as much uh, so we have tips in the handout on what to do in those situations as well. So be sure to look out for that email and, and have a read through to help you through those times when you're when you're leading uh, the discussions in the semester. And next off, after you've you know you've 
you've put together your learning goals, um, you've put together deep, meaningful questions, and, and you've set that classroom environment. Now, something that you're going to have to do and something that you're responsible for as an instructor is giving effective feedback. This is something that you're going to be get, doing continuously. You know, feedback isn't always just, you know, uh, writing a, a paragraph of comments after marking an essay. It's more than that. It's also the little things like uh, comments that you give during the discussions, words of encouragement, words of things to expand on uh, and think about and study. Those are all considered feedback. And why are we giving feedback? Well, feedback can help us identify what students know what they don't know, what's working in the discussion, and what's not working. Don't forget that feedback is both negative and positive. You know, when we think about feedback, oftentimes we're thinking about things that we have to work on. When we think about constructive criticism, uh, feedback, the first thing we think about is constructive criticism. Like, well, okay, what did I do wrong? What do I have to do next time? But you have to also point out the positives. Why? There are multiple reasons. So one, um, you're letting the student know, hey, this is actually something that you're doing right. And I don't want you to get so caught up in the things that you know you have to improve on. I mean, that's great, you know, focusing on that kind of stuff. But I want you to make sure you remember to keep this up because that can sometimes get lost. Sometimes students focus so much on what they have to improve, they lose the things, the components or the characteristics or, or the skills that they were so great at. So you're encouraging them to continue in that aspect and um, you're motivating them, you're letting them know that there is something great about them that they're contributing or that they're doing. Um, and that's, that in itself is motivating. And you're also helping connect with the students um, and that contributes to that positive classroom environment we were talking about, right? Because as you, you know, as you encourage them and, and and build that connection, they in turn are going to be more motivated to contribute in discussions later on. It's important to identify both weaknesses and strengths. So as we said before, you know, weaknesses, they're there to point out so that we can improve on them. And then the strengths, we want them to know what their strengths are uh, so they can continue doing those things. Um, characteristics of effective feedback. One point uh, that was really helpful through me, for me through the years is to focus on the contributions, not the individual. And this is especially important when you're when you're focusing on uh, when you're pointing out weaknesses. Okay, so um, when you're pointing out weaknesses, you don't, you know, you could focus on what the student has done rather than uh, the student themselves. What I mean is, like, for example, let's say that uh, the student sometimes has uh, a hard time, you know, putting things in logical order when they're creating their arguments. Sometimes they're a bit all over the place. You don't want to go to them and say, you know, you're having you're a bit, uh, you're having some trouble with organization. Your organization skills are not that strong. That's something that you don't want to do. That's actually something that's very discouraging. What you want to do is say something like, oh, you know what? You have some great points here, but what can make your argument more powerful and more, um, yeah, more powerful? What can make this argument more powerful and easier to follow along is, you know, you see this point here, why don't we put it, you know, up here or this point here. This is a very strong point, but if we put it at the bottom after explaining all this context that was mentioned before, it will make it more powerful and more easier to follow along. So you're focusing more on the writing or the words or the discussion and not so much on the individual, if that makes sense. You also want to be descriptive and specific. Remember what we said about setting the ground rules in the classroom environment? You know, don't expect everyone has the same expectations as you, right? Same rule falls here. So don't assume that everyone is going to read your comment and automatically know what you're talking about. Um, just as you would appreciate a student being clear in their ideas and formulating their thoughts, you also want to be clear so that when they read, they don't have any um, misunderstandings. There should be no room for misinterpretation. Make sure um, you're giving back the feedback in a timely manner, because if you give feedback too late, one, 
the students um, might already forget about, you know, whether it's feedback on the discussion or or whatever it is, um, if you're waiting as well, especially discussion, if you're waiting too long, they might forget about, you know, the things that they've said, for example, if it was something that, if it was a synchronous discussion, um, it will really make it hard for them to think back to what they said and um, make those changes. Also, by taking too much time, what could happen is, it might be harder for students to apply what they've learned because you know they're already so far into the semester that they've already had like multiple discussions let's say you were evaluating the first discussion that you had if you give back feedback by the second discussion they're able to apply 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 that to the second discussion but if you're giving that feedback by the time like you know you're into midterm season that's going to make it really hard for them to use that feedback to improve themselves. And make sure it's related to learning goals. Um, make sure that you're always focused in the classroom. I know sometimes it can be really easy to get carried away, especially if you're teaching a course that you're really passionate about. You're really passionate about the different topics um, that are there. Maybe it aligns with your research and you have so much to talk about. But remember that in the at the end of the day, your goal is to have the students meet those learning goals uh, so that they can succeed in the class. Make sure the feedback that you're giving uh, relates to the learning goals. And sometimes what I like to do is when I'm giving feedback, whether it's in a discussion or for an assignment or, or pretty much anything, sometimes I like to have um, the main goals for that uh, particular task and keep it on my screen while I'm marking through or giving feedback for all my students. So when formulating feedback, look at your learning goals. Clarify and communication. See if um, clarity and communication. See do they have clear arguments, um, um, or are there certain things that you aren't so sure about when when they're discussing? Like are are you always fully understanding what they're talking about? Like no matter how deep or or how simple their argument is, or do you find yourself trying really hard to understand what they're saying? What is their organiz organization like when they're giving their ideas? Are they a bit all over the place? Does it follow uh, a nice, do their, do their um, discussion topics or answers follow a nice stream of, of connectivity? Or do you feel like it's really hard to follow along? Are they demonstrating good background knowledge? You know, it's essential that before students are discussing in the classroom, they finish the readings and, and the lectures that are assigned to them because that's going to give them the background knowledge that they need in order for them to, you know, successfully uh, participate in those discussions. So does it look like this, the students demonstrate good background knowledge? And if not, that might mean that A, that student um, needs to spend more time on, on um, the, you know, strengthening their background knowledge. Maybe they just haven't, uh, they're having a hard time managing uh, their time and, you know, catching up with the class course content, or maybe they're just not getting it and they need extra help. Or maybe this is a pattern that you see throughout the class. Maybe multiple students are having this problem. Uh, and, you know, maybe there's too much content being put in the class and the, the students need a bit of a break from discussion every once in a while so that they can catch up. Or maybe the content that is in there is not uh, enough for them. You know, maybe they need a bit more to help solidify their knowledge. Maybe the concepts that are in there are a bit too difficult. How are they applying this background knowledge to their answers? So that level of analysis, that level of connection uh, between concepts. And if you're finding that, you know, students are not connecting or analyzing um, uh, the, the, the questions uh, as much, what you can do is you can take a step back when you're giving discussions and, and you can say, okay, like, Let's say you're giving a discussion about how literature in the 18th century affected society um, and led them into, into war, okay? This is, 
so what what do the students need to know at the time? They need to know what kind of literature was around in the 18th century, what the war is about, what caused the war, and what you can do is as you're giving this as you're giving the discussion, you can start out by asking them those simple questions and then slowly, slowly increase the difficulty in the, dis in the discussion questions so that they're able to think a bit more deeper every time. So you could say, ask questions like, okay, so we know that this is what happened in the 18th century, like this is the type of literature that was around. What do you think caused the writer to, talk, to focus on this specific topic? And then you can slowly um, ask deeper and deeper questions to lead you into, you know, the ultimate question that you are leading them to. And then hopefully by then they'll have a deeper, deeper answer to your discussion question. What are their behaviors like with respect to their classmates? So are they interrupting each other? Are they acknowledging each other's responses? And um, when you have a more positive classroom environment, you'll see that students are helping each other and they're and they'll bring up points and and acknowledge the other student that um, help them, you know, help them think those thoughts. So you will see them say something like, for example, oh, Danielle had a really good point about such and such. And it got me thinking about this and how it relates to what we learned in class about, you know, whatever they're focused on. And then when formulating feedback, Focus on changes that can help improve discussion. So focus on give them key action points that they can do to help them, uh, to give them that direction to help bring their next discussion. And so here we're going to move on into our activity. OK, and what we're going to do is we have only a few minutes left. 10 minutes left and we're just going to focus on this one this first question we're going to be sending you guys the powerpoints out as well so if you want if you have free time later on uh, you can practice a bit with the other feedback questions that we have and what you can do for this feedback question is you can just write in the chat what your answer is okay so here's our question here last year over 5,000 species were moved to the list of endangered animals what role should biologists play in conservation? Now, this is a pretty deep question, right? But here you have a response from one of the students that says, I don't think they can do anything. What are some points that you can give uh, as feedback for the students? Okay. So I'll give you a minute to think about that and write your answers in the chat. Mm -hmm. That's a good point. So you're, so Laura said, please justify your answer with three reasons why you think that is. I like that. Justify your answer. And by asking them to um, give three reasons, you're pretty much pushing them to formulate a more complete answer. Three reasons. And think deeper, because this person might just be looking at it and not giving it much thought. Okay, so it gives them an opportunity to think, to improve. And yeah, that's right. What's a valid opinion? That's a valid opinion. However, I think you need to provide more of an explanation as to why that is. Make sure you do a literature search. So they might be missing a bit of background knowledge, and that's why they're having a hard time. So we can actually point out some background knowledge. I like that point, Alex. It might be the background knowledge there. And that can help them with building their argument. That is a valid perspective. So I like how you're focusing there on the perspective itself and foundation for an argument. But expand, right? That's important. So expansion. Ryan says, while your response draws attention to the point that we are running running out of ways to protect endangered animals, which is a great point, but I think you need to detail your response a bit more, including information. Yeah, they do need more detail. Uh, giving them an initiative about how biologists can help. This is an assignment in, in the class that you're GAing. <laughs> well, I hope this feedback session is helping you out. Please let me know your opinion after checking the link before. Ah, so providing that resource. I like that. Thank you, Hamid. 
I sense frustration in your answer. Explain why you're feeling, feeling so frustrated about the role of biologists. Interesting. Yeah, so I like how a lot of people are focusing more on the, you know, the feedback itself rather than the person and giving them some sort of sense of direction is important so that they they know better for, well, they can fix their response this time, but they know better for next time that you have to expand a bit more, right? This isn't really a, a good discussion answer. And so with that, I think uh, we're just going to skip over the summary to give you guys a bit of time for questions. Thank you so much for listening through our presentation today. I think it's been almost an hour and a half, so that's a lot to sit through. But we hope you benefited and learned something that, you, that can help you in the classroom this semester. What sort of questions uh, um, do you have? Uh, what are some, you know, points that you want to learn more about or some, some thoughts that you're struggling with after hearing this presentation? Feel free to also ask us questions that are specific to your um, class, if you'd like. So what should you do if your, gr if your group that you're overseeing just decides to not participate during discussion? Nobody talks, they don't respond to you. Yeah, that's a good question. I think that's particularly difficult for the the uh, GA, right? Especially since you're a student yourself, you have already so much going on. You're spending so much time preparing the the you know the discussion that it ends up being a bit discouraging. But um, what I want to say first off is to make sure that you don't get caught up in that. You don't feel discouraged and take a step back. Maybe you need to, um, and we talk about this a bit in the handout about uh, under, you know, students who are not participating in, in discussion. What you can do is you can give opinion questions or give really simple questions. The reason why I say opinion questions is because there are no right or wrong answers. You can say something like, I don't know, like if you're doing an environment related class, you can say, do you think global warming is real? You know, you can start you can start off with something super simple, but make it opinion based and make it something that's really easy for people to respond to. And then uh, another type of question you can uh, give is something that's knowledge based, but super easy. So something that's very common knowledge for people in that class. And when you start with something like that, you're getting them more used to participating. If it, you see that it's getting a problem, what you can do is you can switch over uh, to writing a bit. So if it's something that's, you know, if you're having um, an oral or live discussion in class, what you can do is you can take some time and um, have the students sit with themselves and respond to that question and come back because sometimes students won't share with you because they feel like uh, their answer is dumb but um, hopefully those are some tips that can help you out and Danielle mentioned that you can remind them of your expectations for the discussion sessions yeah that's a good point and remind them that they're getting marked for it too how should you act if the discussion gets incredibly polarized involves abuse and threats and you feel like it is too late to pacify the students um, I'm trying to think of an example where it gets really out of hand, but I think, and Danielle, you can chime in whenever you'd like to, but always have someone, so in that case, you recommend thinking about ending the session immediately to remind them of appropriate behaviors. Yeah, you don't want it to continue. You want it to stop. And uh, think about the, the uh, different steps that we had for managing conflict and if that doesn't work please just re just reach out to the instructor because it's not your job to carry the whole weight on your shoulders right the, the instructor should be the instructor should be there to help you and you can actually reach out to them during class a lot of them will respond to you and will actually join you if it's if it's something that's held online uh, what is your opinion on having the camera on or off I have experienced this okay they don't seem to be there. Danielle, did you want to answer this last question? Yeah, absolutely. I was actually typing my answer in the chat, but I've also had a similar uh, problem as that, Mary, where having the cameras off, it can be a little bit more challenging. But in that case, it's pretty difficult to know what the right or wrong thing to do may be. And that's just because you never know what somebody's situation or environment that they're in may be. 
so they may not be comfortable turning on their cameras. However, in those situations, I think it would be beneficial to say, set the expectations around either posting on the discussion board or posting in the chat so that you know they're actively involved in the conversation. And if they're not posting, then that just impacts their mark because they're not contributing to the discussion and they're not participating or being engaged. So that just comes back to making sure that they know the expectations for the discussions, whether it's over microphone or in the chat, they have to contribute in some way. And then Kyla said, for the class, I will be a GA. If the professor wants me to filter the questions from the students and ask them on the behalf of the students to the professor, going to be their voice, how to apply these techniques from the session to a position like this one. So is, my question would be, is there a forum where these students are posting these questions? Because on Blackboard, like a discussion board, a lot of students may have the questions, or if you have office hours, they may come to you with questions. If the students seem to be asking similar questions, then that makes it pretty, pretty simple for you as the GA to convey those to the professor. Virtual classroom like this for lecture time. Okay, so maybe the professor is just not managing the chat like Miriam and I were. So maybe that would come down to you managing the chat like like Miriam was during my half of the presentation and how I was when Miriam was doing her half. So if you have questions in the chat, just write them down or record them so that you can go to the professor afterwards and say the majority of the students are asking questions about this concept or about what to do in this situation. I hope that makes sense. Yeah which of the questions are relevant to the course as you filter them out. Yeah, absolutely, Miriam. It's a live Q&A. Okay. Yeah, so just try to see if there are similar questions that the students are asking because you don't want to ask, you don't want to have 50 questions going to the professor that are all essentially asking the same thing. So it may be beneficial if you just see what the general topic might be. So Students are asking questions about this concept rather than all of the details of that concept. Yep, you're very welcome. Well, our time is up. So if anybody has any other questions, I'm happy to stick around.